part one chapter two of the friendship of christ by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain part one christ in the interior soul chapter two the friendship of christ interior it is not good for man to be alone genesis chapter two verse eighteen it seems inconceivable at first sight that a relationship which in any real manner can be called a friendship should be possible between christ and the soul adoration dependence obedience service and even imitation all these things are imaginable but until we remember that jesus christ took a human soul like our own a soul liable to joy and to sorrow open to the assaults of passion and temptation a soul that actually did experience heaviness as well as ecstasy the pains of obscurity as well as the joys of clear vision until this becomes to us from a dogmatic fact apprehended by faith a vital fact perceived by experience a full realization of his friendship is out of the question for just as in the case of ordinary persons the plane of real friendship lies in the communion of the two souls so it is between christ and a man his soul is the point of contact between his godhead and our humanity we receive his body with our lips we prostrate our whole being before his divinity but we embrace his soul with ours number one human friendships usually take their rise in some small external detail we catch a phrase we hear an inflection of a voice we notice the look of the eyes or a movement in walking and the tiny experience seems to us like an initiation into a new world we take the little event as a symbol of a universe that lies behind we think we have detected a soul exactly suited to our own a temperament which either from its resemblance to our own or from a harmonious dissimilarity is precisely fitted to be our companion then the process of friendship begins we exhibit our own characteristics we examine his in point after point we find what we expected to find and we verify our guesses and he too no less follows the same method until that point is reached as it is reached in so many cases though not thank god in all either in a crisis or after a trying period when we discover either that we have been mistaken from the beginning or that we have deceived the other or that the process has run its course the summer is come and gone and that there are no more fruits to gather on either side now the divine friendship the consciousness that is to say that christ desires our love and intimacy and offers his own in return usually begins in the same manner it may be at the reception of some sacrament such as we have received a thousand times before or it may be as we kneel before the crib at christmas or follow our lord along the way of the cross we have done these things or performed these ceremonies dutifully and lovingly again and again yet on this sudden day a new experience comes to us we understand for example for the first time that the holy child is stretching his arms from the straw not merely to embrace the world that world be little enough but to embrace our own soul in particular we understand as we watch jesus blood-stained and weary rising from his third fall 
that he is asking our own very self in particular to help him with his burden the glance of the divine eyes meets our own there passes from him to us an emotion or a message that we had never before associated with our own relations with him the tiny event has happened he has knocked at our door and we have opened he has called and we have answered henceforth we think he is ours and we are his here at last we tell ourselves is the friend for whom we have been looking so long here is the soul that perfectly understands our own the one personality which we can safely allow to dominate our own jesus christ has leapt forward two thousand years and is standing by our side he has come down from the painting on the wall he has risen from the straw in the manger my beloved is mine and i am his number two the friendship has begun then now begins its process the essence of a perfect friendship is that each friend reveals himself utterly to the other flings aside his reserves and shows himself for what he truly is the first step therefore in the divine friendship is the revelation by jesus christ of himself up to this point in our spiritual life however conscientious or dutiful that life may have been there has been a predominant element of unreality it is true that we have obeyed that we have striven to avoid sin that we have received grace forfeited it and recovered it that we have acquired merit or lost it that we have tried to do our duty endeavored to aspire and to love all this is real before god but it has not been real to ourselves we have said prayers yes but we have scarcely prayed we have meditated set the points before us reflected resolved and concluded but the watch has been laid open before us to mark our progress lest we should meditate too long but after this new and marvellous experience all is changed jesus christ begins to exhibit to us not merely the perfections of his past but the glories of his presence he begins to live before our eyes he tears from himself the conventions with which our imaginations have clothed him he lives moves speaks acts turns this way and that before our eyes he begins to reveal secret after secret hidden in his own humanity we have known facts about him all our life we have repeated the catholic creed we have assimilated all that theology can tell us now however we pass from knowledge about him to knowledge of him we begin to understand that eternal life begins in this present for it is to know thee the only true god and jesus christ whom thou hast sent john chapter six verse three our god is becoming our friend on the other side he demands from us what he himself offers if he strips himself before our eyes he claims that we should do the same as our god he knows every fiber of the being which he has made as our saviour he knows every instant in the past in which we have swerved from his obedience but as our friend he waits for us to tell him it is tolerably true to say that the difference between our behaviour respectively to an acquaintance and to a friend is that in the first case we seek to conceal ourselves 
to present an agreeable or a convenient image of our own character to use language as a disguise to use conversation as we might use counters and in the second case that we put aside conventions and makeshifts and seek to express ourselves as we are and not as we would have our friend to think us to be this then is required of us in the divine friendship up to now our lord has been content with very little he has accepted a tithe of our money an hour of our time a few thoughts and a few emotions paid over to him in religious intercourse and worship he has accepted those things instead of ourselves henceforth he demands that all such conventions should cease that we should be entirely open and honest with him that we should display ourselves as we really are that we should lay aside in a word all those comparatively harmless make-believes and courtesies and be utterly real and it is probably true to say that in practically every instance where a soul believes herself disillusioned or disappointed with the divine friendship it is not that she has actually betrayed her lord or outraged him or failed to rise to his demands in other matters but that she has never truly treated him as a friend at all she has not been courageous enough to comply with that absolutely necessary condition of all true friendship namely a complete and sincere straightforwardness with him it is far less injurious to friendship to say outright i cannot do this thing that is asked of me because i am a coward than to find excellent reasons for not doing it number three roughly speaking then this is the course which the divine friendship must take we must consider later in detail the various events and incidents that characterize it for it is an immense consolation to remember that there is not one such incident that has not been experienced by other souls before us the way of divine love has been trodden and retrodden already a thousand times and it is useful too to reflect before going further that since this friendship is one between two human souls it will follow in a great degree the regular lines of all other friendships there are moments in it of bewildering bliss at communion or in prayer moments when it appears as indeed it is to be the one supreme experience of life moments when the whole being is shaken and transfused with love when the sacred heart is no longer merely an object for adoration but a pulsating thing that beats against our own when the bridegroom's arms are about us and his kiss on our lips there are periods too of tranquillity and steady warmth of an affection at once strong and reasonable of an esteem and an admiration satisfying to the will and the intellect as well as to the sensitive or emotional parts of our nature and there are periods too months or years of misery and dryness times at which it seems as if we actually needed patience with our divine friend cases in which he appears to treat us with coldness or disdain there will actually be moments in which it needs all the loyalty we have not to cast him off as fickle and deceptive there will be misunderstandings darknesses obscurities yet as time passes and as we emerge through these crises one by one we come more and more to verify that conviction with which we first embraced our friend 
for this is indeed the one friendship in which final disappointment is impossible and he the one friend who cannot fail this is the one friendship for whose sake we cannot humiliate ourselves too much cannot expose ourselves too much cannot give too intimate confidences or offer too great sacrifices it is in the cause of this one friend only and of his friendship that the words of one of his intimates are completely justified in which he tells us that for his sake it is good to count all things to be but loss and count them but as dung that i may gain christ philippians chapter three verse eight end of part one chapter two